So we have made a, a set of models for every country in the world uh, that reflect the Omicron variant. It's dramatic spread around the world, the rapid surge that we in infections and cases, and we have modeled through to what that implies for hospitalizations and deaths through till uh, the beginning of April. At the global level, we expect uh, 3 billion or more Omicron infections in the next two to three months. Uh, that will translate into uh, a tripling of global reported cases because the infection detection rate is going to be lower. That will translate into a global surge in hospitalization, but fortunately smaller than the previous Delta surge and previous winter surge in the Northern Hemisphere. And even smaller will be the global impact in terms of mortality, but global deaths will go up somewhat in the next few months. Well, we expect because of the increased transmissibility of Omicron, the immune escape, uh, we are go going to see a huge increase in infections globally. So over the next three months, we expect about three, three billion or more infections. And this is really, uh, to put that in context, that's as many infections in the next two to three months as we've seen in the entire pandemic so far. So re really extraordinary increase in infections and daily infections at the global level will reach a peak over 35 million a day sometime in mid-January. And to put that in context to the enormous previous peak of the Delta wave in India in April, that was a peak of about 12 and a half to 13 million infections a day. So triple what we saw before. Now, uh, it varies by country, uh, of course, to based on how much uh, infection there's been with, uh, recently with other variants and the vaccination levels. But at the global level and country by country, we're gonna see a truly enormous surge in infections. Uh, now, eventually we, in our spread of Omicron, we believe that Omicron is going to reach all countries really quite soon given how quickly it is dispersed and how many asymptomatics there are. And then we expect even countries uh, that have had very uh, tight control of borders, such as New Zealand, um, we expect that because of the experience around Delta and even with managed border crossings, uh, Delta getting into the general population, and given that Omicron is more able to do that, we should expect to see Omicron uh, surges essentially in, in all countries, including in China, we suspect, in the future. So we don't expect reported cases, which is essentially infections that get diagnosed, they get tested and get confirmed as a case, whether they're symptomatic or that fraction of asymptomatics that get detected. But we don't expect detected cases to surge as much as infections. Because there's such a larger fraction of infections that are asymptomatic, many will not even seek out testing. And only those that are picked up by some routine screening program, either employee or school-based, are likely to be detected. And therefore, we expect to see the infection detection rate, the fraction of infections that do get a positive um, test, uh, will drop. And so we should see peaks that are smaller than the number of uh, yeah, that, that massive upswing in global infections. Probably detected infections at the global level will be three times the previous peak that we saw for Delta. And in the US, we expect to top out at somewhere just over 400,000 cases a day. Well, the, the impact on hospitalizations and deaths, of course, is what everyone is most concerned about. And uh, that is really what um, I think if there is any shred of good news in what we're seeing, that's perhaps uh, where we can look. Because of the greatly reduced infection hospitalization rate and the even more reduced infection fatality rate, this massive surge of infections and cases will translate into a smaller uh, surge in hospitalizations than either the Delta wave or the winter peak last winter. 
uh, at the global level. Now, that story will vary very much by country. Australia and New Zealand should see a much worse uh, epidemic than they have seen so far. But many countries should actually uh, see a smaller hospital surge and certainly a smaller surge in deaths than their previous surges that they've lived through. In a country like, for example, the United States, the numbers suggest that hospitalization will be a possibly higher than uh, the Delta peak that we saw in early September, uh, but about the same level as the winter peak last year in terms of hospitalization. And then in terms of death, it should be lower than either the Delta peak in September or the winter peak last year. So, now that story will be very different country by country. Um, one country that is you know, ahead of others in terms of managing uh, this wave of Omicron is the United Kingdom. And in the United Kingdom, we expect to see um, a big surge in infections, in cases, a surge in hospitalization, even though it's not yet appeared, uh, and then a very modest increase in death um, in, um, and much lower than the previous winter surge last year uh, in the UK. Modeling the impact of Omicron and understanding the impact of Omicron, uh, we need to go through sort of the key aspects of the new variant that are going to determine the next two to three months. So first, Omicron we know is more transmissible. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, there is what we call immune escape. That is that 40 to 60% of people that have been infected with, a, with another variant like Delta, let's say, or the ancestral uh, variants, uh, are still going to be susceptible to getting Omicron. So the combination are what's driving this very rapid increase in cases that we're seeing in many countries. Secondly, and very importantly for understanding the impact of Omicron, is that the fraction of infections that are asymptomatic appears to be much higher. There's a number of sources of data, perhaps the most compelling from South Africa, but we've seen this in analyses for sports teams in the US as well. Uh, but it's likely that we've gone from about 40% of infections being asymptomatic to over 90 and perhaps as, even as high as 95% asymptomatic. Number third is that given the data that we have available from South Africa, from the United Kingdom, from Denmark, from Norway, uh, we see that the infection hospitalization rate, that is the number, the fraction of infections that end up in hospital, by the way, that's different than the case hospitalization rate, because that's just hospitalizations divided by reported cases. But since many infections go undetected, we're talking about the infection hospitalization rate. That is probably 90 to 96 percent lower for Omicron than for Delta. And then last, and certainly not least, is that the infection fatality rate, the, de the, number, the deaths out of those who get infected, is also dramatically lower for Omicron compared to Delta, likely 97 to 99% lower. Well, it's been a number of weeks since we had a model release. And the reason has been that we've had to substantially modify our model to take into account two really fundamental things. First, to be able to model Omicron, uh, we realized we really needed to keep track of <clears throat> each variant on its own, infection with the ancestral variants or with alpha, with beta, with gamma, with delta, and now Omicron and a, and a grab bag of other variants as well. Because uh, if Omicron is able to reinfect people that have had a previous infection with let's say Delta, well, as the science evolves, we may learn more and more about the relationship between infection with one variant and it's the protection it gives for another variant. So we've revamped the model to capture and track different variants individually. Secondly, we've met to take into account waning of immunity because what we've learned well before Omicron, but we've been working on trying to incorporate this is that infection acquired immunity and vaccine derived immunity both wane over time. That waning is actually pretty fast for uh, prevention of infection, uh, maybe 
50% reduction in immunity at uh, 30 weeks or more, depending on the vaccine, and that waning immunity for preventing hospitalization and death is fortunately slower than that. Now, even amongst the vaccines and vaccine-derived immunity, there's quite a difference with the Moderna having the slowest level of waning, followed by Pfizer, much faster waning for Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. Now, the other thing that we have done in, this, uh, in the model, which sort of is a consequence of what I just described, is we are capturing the waning of infection-acquired immunity and as well as vaccine derived immunity. And that will make a big difference to the forecast that we have for each location, depending on how recent the last Delta wave was and, and where they stand on vaccination. Well, we've included new scenarios in our analysis. Uh, we have uh, got a scenario where mask use goes up to 80%. Uh, we have previously had a 95% mask use scenario, which is the level that some countries have achieved, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of progress in countries over the last year in mask use, so we have made a less ambitious, maybe more achievable 80% target for mask use. That has a really big effect. Cuts transmission uh, quite substantially. It cuts down reported cases. It has a consequential effect on hospitalizations and deaths. So mask use comes out in our analysis as by far and away the most effective strategy to manage Omicron right now. Uh, more rapid uh, or, or increasing uh, third doses of vaccination above what we assume in the reference scenario, which is that we assume that 80% of those that have been uh, vaccinated with two doses in the past uh, we'll get a third dose at six months. We've, in a scenario, increased that to 100%. So it's a, it's a modest increment in who gets a third dose. That has some effect. Now, we have not modeled shortening the period of el eligibility for a booster from six months to three or four months. That will be something coming in, in, in the future. That's likely to have a bigger effect than the one that we've modeled so far. Now, uh, the other thing that we note on the policy front is that many of the policies around uh, testing in schools, in the workplace, uh, that evolved for prior variants with much higher infection hospitalization rates and infection fatality rates, and the required period of isolation after a positive test are going to be very problematic uh, during the Omicron surge, because the numbers are so much larger for Omicron. So many people will be asymptomatic. It really, if you follow the same protocols, you may end up with some employers with a huge reduction uh, in available staff. And I think many uh, organizations will have to rethink whether or not um, testing of asymptomatics and isolation is actually going to make a difference um, and is worth the, 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 the disruption at school or in the workplace. Last on the policy front is clearly in an era where infections, you know, most of them are very mild, that even reported cases, many of them are going to be mild. Uh, it's probably time at the local level to shift our focus from reported cases to what's happening to hospitalizations. So we believe the timely relevant metric to track in the future with, during Omicron is going to be hospital admissions. Um, and that will help us keep focused on severe outcomes and what's happening in different communities. So there's a lot that individuals can do uh, to protect themselves if they uh, see the need. Uh, first, uh, getting the third dose, if you've already had uh, two doses of vaccination, substantially increases your protection against Omicron. Uh, secondly, for the unvaccinated and never infected, they're the individuals at greatest risk. And so if you're in that category, vaccination is really uh, tremendously important for protecting you uh, from hospitalization and death. 
And if you are even previously infected, uh, what we do know is that vaccination on top of previous infection is going to boost your immune response substantially and enhance your, your uh, protection against infection and hospitalization and death um, from Omicron. Third, wear a mask. And now as we've learned more and more through the pandemic, high quality masks, KN95s, N95s are better. So the higher quality mask that you can wear, the better you are going to be off in preventing uh, transmission to you from others uh, of Omicron. Now for those who are at increased risk, due to age or due to comorbidities, uh, it really makes sense uh, if you want to minimize your risk to avoid indoor gatherings. Um, and uh, that's your, your safest strategy to, to reduce personal risk. So in modeling Omicron, the big challenge, and the reason it's taken us several weeks to get to the point where we have models for every country in the world, uh, is the enormous uncertainties around critical as aspects of Omicron. There's huge uncertainty about how severe it is. Um, and although we put out in our reference scenario what we think is most consistent with the available data, we suspect that our forecast may still be somewhat pessimistic about hospitalization and death. The reason is that we're just not seeing the increase in the United Kingdom in hospital admissions that we should be, according to our own model. Uh, and you know that does open the door that in future revisions of the model, we may even reduce further the infection uh, hospitalization rate. We've already reduced it, as we've mentioned, by uh, you know uh, a huge percentage, uh, but we may need to reduce that further. Now, to encompass the other end of the spectrum, that things may be worse than what we're seeing, and that perhaps in places where there are more people that are unvaccinated and never infected, Omicron could be much worse. We have got a more severe Omicron scenario included in the release, and you'll see in that that infections and cases are the same, but hospitalizations and deaths are greater because we've erred on the higher side of the uncertainty intervals that are compatible with the available data on the uh, uh, infection hospitalization rate and infection fatality rate. Now, there's a third question um, that, uh, or, or issue on, around uncertainty, which is unfortunately, we don't expect data in the next two weeks to help resolve any of these uncertainties because we were judging by last year, the period from December 20th right through to about January 2nd or 3rd is a period of increasing lags in reporting of cases, hospitalizations and deaths. So much so that many efforts and governments la a year ago at this time were very misled by, by the available data. And so we probably won't get further clarity on some of these assumptions and uncertainties around Omicron well into the second week of uh, January. Uh, now, in terms of what are we watching the, the most closely that might be changed in, the, in future releases of our model, it's really the fraction that are asymptomatic, the degree of immune escape, and of course, what I've, I've tried to reiterate multiple times, severity, where you know, the evidence base push us to it's less severe than we've currently said, or possibly more severe than what we've said in terms of the infection hospitalization rate and the infection fatality rate. 